Hey everybody, I just wanted to show you some of the gear that I'm using because people keep asking about it. Um, the, the fact of the matter is you don't really need a lot of expensive gear to do some experimenting in virtual production. All you really need is some kind of a camera. Um, a common one is something like this Logitech webcam right here. This is about $60 to $70 on Amazon or other places, uh, and it'll work just fine with Unreal. Uh, what I've been using for most of the demos you've seen, I, I've used this one for some of my early ones. For most of the demos you've seen, I've been using this camera. This is a Sony industrial camera uh, that uh, is designed for low light and other things. It's kind of overkill for this, uh, but I was able to borrow one. So you can see here I've got a tracker that's mounted on this plate that the camera is also attached to. This is just a standard six inch bolt and some nuts, and that works fine. Uh, then this camera here in the middle, this is a Sony uh, a7R4, and uh, it's a, actually a pretty high-end camera with a really big piece of glass on the front of it here for a zoom lens. Um, and it's also in a small rig cage, which gives you, as you can see, a whole lot of little screw holes and other places to attach things like this Vive Tracker, uh, which is just on a standard mount. Um, so those are the cameras I've been using. Uh, they all work really well. Pretty much any camera you find is going to use okay, work okay. You just need something that gives you a clean video output. And by clean, I mean an output that doesn't have any graphics or other stuff overlaid on it like the current camera settings and stuff. Um, most Sony cameras have an option to be clean output. Uh, and an awful lot of other cameras do too. Uh, the Sony ones are the only ones I've used so far. Um, but those and some kind of HDMI input interface for your computer will get you the video into the system that you need to do the virtual production work. Okay, the second thing you need to do some virtual production work is you need a tripod to hold your camera steady. Uh, particularly if you're not using a tracker, you need a tripod that's sturdy enough to stay in one place and uh, not move between shots because it takes a little time to line the camera up when you're not using trackers. So what, are, what kind of uh, tripods can you get? Well, this one's a really cheap one from Amazon Basics. It's made out of plastic mostly. And uh, honestly, it's not really good for anything but holding up very lightweight things like a webcam, like this Logitech one, uh, a microphone, or possibly some lightweight LED lights. Uh, I wouldn't try to use this on a heavier camera like this one or this one. It's just not sturdy enough. Um, this one here is a little more sturdy. Uh, it's still in the $20, $30 tripod range. Um, and it will hold a heavier camera like one of these. But the thing that both of these tripods lack is any kind of safety features for your camera. So if you spent money on your camera, even if it's only $100 or $200, the one thing you don't want is to end up breaking your camera because you cheaped out on the tripod. Um, what's missing on this tripod and this tripod uh, is anything to keep it from just slamming forward if you forget to tighten the, the, um, the tripod head when you let go of that handle. Um, there's, if the tripod isn't perfectly balanced and your camera's sitting on it with a heavy lens like this one, uh, if you have loosened up this tripod to do a shot and you let go of it without, forgetting to t without tightening it back up, bang, and your camera could have its lens damaged. So I don't recommend these for anything except a very lightweight camera. Um, what is really good are these kind of camera tripods. Um, these are two different ones. One's from Manfrotto here. Uh, this one I forget the manufacturer of, but it's very similar. Um, the nice thing about both of these is they have what's called a fluid head. That's this part right here. And a fluid head has some liquid in it that acts like a shock absorber so that when you go to move it, it moves nice and smoothly. Uh, that's really great for getting good shots. You'll get nice smooth shots if you're careful. Whereas with these kind, it's almost impossible to get a really smooth pan or tilt. Uh, the other thing that's good about fluid heads is they have the added safety of that drag on them. So if you forget to tighten the head up, and you let go of the handle, instead of slamming down like it would on one of these tripods, the camera will just slowly droop and it won't be damaged. So I would recommend you spend probably, you know, $50 to $100 on a tripod that has a good fluid head in it if you're planning on 
moving the camera around if you have an expensive camera or if you just want to have a little more safety and a little more solid uh, shooting experience. That's just my recommendation. Don't cheap out on the tripod. You don't want to break your camera because you bought a cheap tripod. Now on to a little bit about mounting the tracker. Uh, this is a standard Vibe tracker that you see right up here on top. As you can see, this camera doesn't have a hot shoe on top or any other mounting facilities. So the best way to get the tracker and the camera all mounted together was to use what they call a cheese plate. This is just basically a, a, a plate of metal with a bunch of holes in it. Um, and uh, mount the camera to it and then mount the tracker to it. Now originally I had the tracker down here right on the plate but that didn't work terribly good because the, uh, the camera was blocking the tracker's view of the five base stations. So I just bought a, uh, a quarter 26 inch bolt, which is really secure. It's a piece of steel and some washers and nuts, as you can see, and uh, that mounted it up in the air and it works much better. Uh, the only problem with this thing is that no matter how much you tighten the bolts, this thing can still very easily rotate if you bump it. Uh, and that might not seem like too much of a problem, but every time it rotates, uh, you could mess up your shot and have to recalibrate everything. Uh, particularly if you've got a, if you're running the Vive Tracker with a USB cable instead of wirelessly, you can bump the cable and throw everything out of whack. Don't know of any good way to solve that problem right now. Now this camera is some more standard uh, mirrorless camera. Uh, this approach works for DSLRs also. Um, now in this case it's an A7R4 from Sony. Uh, and you may notice it looks a little odd. That's because it has this metal cage around it, which comes from a company called Small Rig. Uh, and the purpose of the cage is, as you can see, it has all kinds of little threaded mounting holes all over the place. So if you want to mount other gear like trackers, batteries, you know, or even just have some clamps to hold your cables so they won't accidentally get pulled out, a cage like that is a good thing to have. Now you can see in this case the tracker is mounted to the cage and not to the camera. The camera has a hot shoe here. Um, the cage also has a shoe right here, which I put a ball head into and then mounted the tracker on top. Uh, nice thing about that setup is it moves the tracker to one side a bit so that I can use the viewfinder a little more easily uh, if I want to. The only problem again, no matter how much you tighten up these things, they, the, the main thread can still rotate. So they can still get out of whack. Okay, the next thing you need if you're going to be doing some filming is you're going to need light. Now what you're looking at right now is what they call a cob or chip on board light. Uh, the front of that uh, part that you see that's yellow is actually one great big giant LED. Uh, it run, takes about 60 watts of power to run it and it puts out one heck of a lot of light. Uh, this isn't by any chance the most powerful light you're going to see, but it is one of the cheapest at about $137. The light that it puts out just as it sits here is pretty harsh. It makes sharp shadows and those can be hard to deal with on a green screen. So the other thing that you need to go with it is what's called a softbox. And as you can see here, that great big thing of white and black stuck on the front of that light is a softbox. Now what a softbox is, is basically it's like a big umbrella that bounces the light around and gives you a nice even output of light that spreads throughout the room and gives you nice soft shadows. And aside from cutting back on the shadows, it also makes people look a lot better. Now if you don't happen to have a softbox, or you don't want to spend money on it, or maybe you don't want to spend money on lights at all, you can get away with sunlight in a lot of cases. Now in my case, I happen to have a window here. If the sunlight is even hitting directly on this, I can close the blinds down a bit so that I won't get any direct sunlight, but I'll still get in a whole lot of light. And that can work. Uh, it's a little hard to control at times. The sun can go behind a cloud and screw up your shots. But if you don't want to spend money on lights, it'll work. Just stay away from direct sunlight. Uh, if you don't have a window that has blinds like this, you can always take a white sheet 
or uh, some diffusion fabric, some thin white fabric, and just hang it in front of the, the window, and it'll turn that window from an uns insanely bright sunlight source down to a nicely diffused white source that'll actually look pretty good. Some of the first demos that I shot in this room, I did using just the light from that window and no extra lights at all. But I gotta admit that the, the approach, the light you get out of one of these things is a lot nicer to look at. So that's what the soft box looks like turned on. The other nice thing about one of these soft boxes in front of your light is that as it sits, if you look straight into one of those uh, lights like there, it'll pretty much blind you and leave spots in front of your eyes. But when you put a, a soft box in front of it like this, it spreads the light out over a two by two foot piece of cloth and you can actually look at it without hurting your eyes. So it's much nicer when you're standing in front of the light. And then of course the one thing that you gotta have uh, is a green screen. It's not much to look at, it's basically just a big piece of muslin. Cost about $25 or so off of Amazon. Uh, it has a little pocket at the top that you can thread a curtain rod through. And you can see here I've got two of these red contractor poles holding up a third curtain rod from a, just a regular Home Depot curtain rod um, that holds the whole thing up. Uh, this uh, green screen is actually about 10 by 20 foot. So most of it right now is piled up on the floor, as you can see, but if I want to spread out that part on the floor, it gives me enough green that I can stand on and get a head to toe shot as long as I have a wide enough angle lens to work with. Um, as you can tell when I'm shooting here on my iPhone, there's barely enough room for me to even show you the whole room, but I'll give it a try anyway. You can get an idea of how small a space I'm working in. It's just a spare bedroom. Not much room to work with at all. So you can do virtual production in a really small space like an office. As far as hanging up the green screen, you can take a look at some of my other uh, videos. I had some information on how you can use magnets uh, or uh, other uh, magnetic hooks to hang the, uh, the green screen off of a suspended ceiling that has metal rails instead of using the poles that you saw me use here. Um, that actually works quite well for me as long as your ceiling doesn't shake too much. It might throw off the trackers, but it's a real simple way of plugging everything onto the ceiling and being able to move it easily. And if you think that magnets can hold up uh, equipment like this, the ones I'm using can, a small magnet about that big can hold a good 30 something pounds. So uh, they work pretty well and they're very secure. Just take a look at the uh, other videos on my channel for information about the poles that I was using in here in this room uh, or uh, the magnets that I used in one of my other studios. Uh, you probably saw this from a distance when I was panning around the room. This is one of the Vive trackers. It's a little box that projects infrared light into the room and allows the trackers to tell where they are. Here is the uh, other Vive lighthouse on the other side of the room. Uh, I've been calling them lighthouses. The, the Vive people have started calling them just uh, base stations. Uh, it's pretty much interchangeable. The lighthouse was just an early name for it. And sitting on top of the camera here is another piece of kit that will definitely make your life easier. Um, yeah, I know, it's just a tape measure. Uh, but what it is is a metric tape measure. Since all of uh, Unreal's measurements are done in centimeters, it's really handy to have a metric tape measure around so that you don't have to keep converting from inches to centimeters all the time when you're measuring out your space. Uh, another thing that you might uh, want to have is if you're recording sound like I am now, this is a uh, Rode Wireless Go microphone, a wireless mic. Um, it's not obvi obviously it's a, a bit on the obtrusive side. If you want to, you can plug a a lavalier mic into it and, and uh, make that almost invisible. Um, but it's a pretty good option, it costs around $200. Um, if you don't want to spend that much, you can get a lavalier mic with a, a long cord for probably around 20 or so, uh, and that'll work uh, just as well. Uh, it's always good to have uh, a uh, microphone that's close to you. Uh, I, you. As you see maybe behind me here, I also have this shotgun mic. 
a lot of people think that you can get really good audio from one of these from a long ways off, but that's really not true. Uh, anytime you, uh, you get one of these more than about, say, 18 inches away from someone, you'll start to pick up echoes from the room and it won't sound as good. So if you want to use something like this, it's a great option, but you uh, generally have to suspend it on a pole above the person out of the shot and try and keep it within about 18 inches or so. If you do that, it'll sound just as good as the, the wireless mic I'm using right now. The other thing you need is some way of getting video into your computer that's compatible with Unreal. This is actually kind of a problem at times. Um, <clears throat> I've only found a few things that work. Uh, the, the, the Blackmagic and AJA video input cards are very good. They're broadcast quality. Uh, and they produce really good uh, results. Unfortunately, they all cost a minimum of about $800 or so. Uh, so it is a bit of a sticker shock if you're trying to do this cheaply. Uh, something that will work that is fairly cheap uh, is the Elgato CamLink 4K USB, which costs, uh, I believe, $90 to $100, depending on where you buy it. Um, and this is an HDMI to USB 3. So you do need USB 3 on your camera or on your computer if you're going to be able to do that, to use this interface. The, um, the one thing that it, most of the inexpensive interfaces out there don't have, but that the uh, Aja and Blackmagic cards do, is something called Genlock. This allows you to lock Unreal's uh, rendering rate to the output frame rate of your camera. And while this may sound a little techy, basically what it means is, is that you'll get a consistent amount of time between when a frame comes into the camera and, or in, and when it ends up on Unreal. So when you do delays and things to compensate for the fact that tracker data comes in faster than video, uh, it'll stay nice and consistent. Uh, with a webcam, uh, it's a lot less consistent with something like the CamLink 4K. Uh, it's still a little less consistent than, than you'd like it to be. So uh, it's not going to produce the kind of sharp professional results, but for experimenting, it's perfect. It doesn't cost a lot of money. There may be other cards and things that do work. Um, I have tried a number of other capture cards that are out on the market. And honestly, about half of them did not work with Unreal at all. Uh, I'm not really sure why this is, but uh, it just seems to be a matter of how the way the drivers are designed and written. So if you do want to try some card that I haven't mentioned, uh, I'd suggest you buy it from some place that will let you return it without a penalty, just in case it doesn't work. Um, the, uh, also, when you're looking at the Aja and Black Magic cards, be sure to look at the supported cards list on the plugins on the Unreal site. Um, if you buy something that isn't on the supported list, it may not work. So I just wanted to give you a little bit of background on why I'm doing all this. Uh, I've been interested in movie special effects probably since the middle 70s, uh, and I've been studying how they were uh, done ever since movies like Star Wars. I've never actually worked in the special effects industry up to now, although I have worked in a number of different television stations. Um, but it's nice to be able to finally have equipment that you can afford that lets you do some of these really cool video tricks like virtual production does. Uh, so the reason I'm messing with all this is that I was trying to figure out just how difficult it is to set up. Uh, and it turns out that the learning curve can be a little bit steep uh, because but I think that's mostly because a lot of these uh, software that people use right now isn't very well documented because it's still very new. A lot of this stuff has only been out for six or seven months uh, and some of it for even less. So as it gets documented better by people like me and the other people in the community, uh, it'll be much, much easier for people to put it together and get it uh, to work for them. Okay, so that's about it. I shot all this on my uh, iPhone 10 so that I'd be able to roam around the room a little easier uh, and give you pictures of all the different gear. Uh, I hope uh, this saw answers a lot of your questions about the studio setup. If not, leave a comment and I'll try to fill in any missing spaces.